This program is another standard service of the more than 21,000 standard oil dealers and agents in mid-America who give meaning to the pledge, you expect more from standard and you get it. It's the magic hour, 7 p.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the first in our eighth annual lecture series. And we are thrilled to be here in our eighth year, and we have a lot more great stories to tell, believe me. So we think there will be subsequent years after this. If you have not seen the entire roster of our uh, four lecture series, be sure to pick up a flyer out in the lobby. Um, they will all be on the last Tuesday of the month through April. And a lot of great topics this year. A lot of great celebrations that we are honoring with our lectures. And I hope on your way in that you had a chance to, do, to view the display boards about two of our local radio stations, uh, WOI and KASI. If you didn't have a chance on the way in, maybe you could take a look on the way out. But a lot of great information about our own local broadcasters. Now, our program is funded by Humanities Iowa, a private nonprofit state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Humanities Iowa provides a wonderful roster of speakers who are available to Iowa communities. And there are brochures in the lobby if you would like more information about Humanities Iowa and how you can source that speaker list for your own organization. Now, there are hundreds of local history stories as interesting as the one that you will hear tonight. But putting them together takes time and resources. Ames Historical Society memberships provide those resources. So please consider becoming a member to ensure the preservation of our collective past. We sincerely thank those in the audience who are already members. Your support means absolutely everything to us. I'm pleased to introduce Jeff tonight. Jeff Stein is an author, historian, and educator. He's an associate professor of communications at William Penn University and has taught at the college level for more than 20 years, including Iowa State University, Buena Vista University, Marshalltown Center, and Wartburg College. He won the 2011 National Award of Merit from the American Association for State and Local History and is recognized as a foremost broadcast historian in Iowa. He is the executive director of the Iowa Broadcast News Association and is a member of the State Historical Society of Iowa Board of Trustees. His 2004 book, Making Waves, the People and Places of Iowa Broadcasting, hold up, demonstration copy. <laughs> this is the only comprehensive history ever published of radio and television and their impact on the state of Iowa and we are very pleased to have that book in our lobby shop tonight. And of course, Jeff is here to sign a copy if you happen to buy one. His book, One Week in June, The Floods of Iowa Floods of 2008, was a Barnes & Noble number one bestseller. His latest effort is Iowa's WHO Radio, the voice of the Middle West. Jeff has also produced a number of award-winning documentaries. His latest, From the Battlefront to the Home Front, Iowa Broadcasters Go to War was produced with Humanities Iowa support. And um, I think Jeff said there are DVDs available out in the lobby of this um, uh, documentary as well. So I know that Jeff has a very interesting program tonight, and please give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Kathy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate everyone turning out, especially on such a wonderful Iowa winter night. <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be even more wonderful in a very short time. One of the things that I've had the great pleasure of doing over the past 15 years or so is to really study and help chronicle the history of Iowa radio and television. And I think it is unique, not just because we are here in Iowa, not just because I've lived my whole life in Iowa and I'm biased, but a number of firsts and a number of bests happened in the state of Iowa. And I think it has something to do with the Midwest work ethic. There are a lot of folks, and again, I teach at the college level, and unfortunately I see it more and more among young people, where the first 
little hint of a problem or difficulty leads to them throwing their hands in the air uh, or picking up their phone and trying to text someone for help um, or just playing a game, one or the other, I can't tell which. <laughs> but in the old days, and especially the agriculture background that we have here in the Midwest, no is not an option. Failure is not an option. You just have to get things done. And I'm reminded of when I was probably about 20 years of age, and I was working for a radio station in Marshalltown. And we were to cover the Gladbrook Corn Carnival Parade live on the radio. <laughs> all the pageantry, all the color, all the excitement. <laughs> More importantly, we had plenty of advertisers who wanted to be associated with the product. And that's why we did parades on the radio. Well, <laughs> the short part of the story is that the engineering staff had miscalculated how many different mobile units that we needed for the AM and the FM. And the bottom line was we had figured out with about five minutes to spare that we were going to be sending two different signals on the same frequency at the same time. And that just gets confusing for the audience. <laughs> And here I am saying, well, what are we going to do? We just can't do this at all. And my boss, a wonderful guy named Al Schrock, who was from Marshall County, um, said, I've got an idea. Follow me. Well, he was the boss. So, of course, we got into the station vehicle, which had the call letters on the side, and started driving down the parade route. Half the people who were waiting for the parade thought that we were the start of the parade and started applauding and looking to see if candy was going to be thrown. <laughs> there was no candy. He drove along and he saw a couple sitting on their front step. Their house was right on the parade route. And he backs the car into the driveway, opens up the hatchback where the mobile unit was, and he said, hi, I'm Al Schrock from KFJB. Do you mind if I borrow your phone? Now keep in mind, this is 1983. You didn't carry your phone with you. You actually had to go to a place that had a phone. And he said, uh, the, the person said, sure, you can use our phone. At which point, Al then pulled out his pocket knife, unscrewed the plate from the wall of the house, took the phone wires out, hooked them up to our mobile unit in a way that I still don't know, but it involved going through the kitchen window. I remember that. <laughs> And all of a sudden, he had a phone line jerry-rigged to our equipment so that the parade could go on the air 30 seconds late, but we didn't miss any of the parade. Everything was just fine. And it taught me a wonderful lesson, which again is, no is not an option. We have a broadcast. And if it means borrowing somebody's phone, literally taking the wires out of the wall, then that's what you did. And that's what a lot of folks in radio and television do all the time. Now, those of you who have, and I know there are many of you here who have been in the field, know a bit of what I'm talking about. Those of you who simply listen or watch, you don't know half of what goes on because in the background, we narrowly avert disaster on a daily basis. It all looks very smooth and calm to you. And that's one of the things that I think is the hallmark of a good broadcast. I don't care what's going on behind the scenes. If the audience got the information that they were expecting, and if it was done fairly smoothly, then I guess everything worked out. What I want to do tonight is to simply hit a very small amount of the history of Iowa broadcasting. And I want to do it through a number of audio and video clips that might bring back some memories, or at least might connect you with something else. And so I want to start with a little walk down memory lane with regard to radio. We'll see how many of these you might remember over a period of time. Standard Oil and your local Standard Oil dealers and agents invite you to listen to the Standard Oil News Roundup, a service of WHO Hotline News. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jack Shelley, and these are the headlines in the news this noon. U.S. Marines have scored an apparent victory over the Viet Cong. President Johnson is holding a news conference right now. Details on these headlines in just a moment. ladies and gentlemen. It comes to you from the doorway of the Standard Tire Company at the corner of 1st Avenue and 1st Street in downtown Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's a nice day, although it's clouding over a bit. Shirt sleeve weather. 
You can take off your coats today. Beautiful day for baseball. Much too warm for football. My goodness, I'd hate to be wearing busting pads today. Those of you that have been gone on vacation and those of you that are planning to go, why, uh, we're glad those of you that are back because we wouldn't want to lose any listeners. And those of you that are leaving, we hope you'll drive carefully and uh, be back with us for all the things that are going on that we do it's have. It's too early to tell what will happen to farm prices generally. Today at our terminal markets, cattle prices increased 27% and hogs 17.5%. Shenandoah Markets bought butcher hogs at $17 per hundred, up 18%. Little or no increase. It's time for Johnny Kettleson and the Sunshine Boys. 30 minutes of music brought to you by the Hubbard Milling Company. Canada on KIOA from the 9 plus 40 with a dedication song. It's five minutes after one on the new Dick Young's program. Now more winners, more often with more cash calls here on KIOA, the prize winning station. So as you can see, over the course of the history of the Hubbard Milling Company, which is now 100 years old and really 100 years old in this very city, we have spanned the whole spectrum. Back in the early part of the last century, a lot of folks experimented at colleges and universities throughout the country, including here in Iowa and including at Iowa State, with what was called wireless telegraphy, meaning sending Morse code signals through the air as opposed to through a line. And so literally the first broadcasts of what we know as radio sounded very much like this. I'm sure you got all that. <laughs> In fact, Morse code was regularly being transmitted from something called 9YI at Iowa State College back in 1913. One of the very first radio stations in Iowa that was officially licensed by the Commerce Department was what became WOI. And the first broadcast was 91 years ago, April 28, 1922. Now, that sound is something you don't really recognize. But very quickly, as radio took hold in America, we all recognized this. Probably the most recognizable three musical notes, and of course, it stood for NDC. Now we'll see how good your knowledge of music is. What are the three notes that were played? Because I took piano lessons a long time ago, and there's no NP. <laughs> I wasn't very good, but I know there was no NP. There are the letters G, E, C. Why did they pick G, E, C? Because the primary owner of NBC was the General Electric Company. <laughs> Subtlety was not a strong point, all right? And in fact, the National Broadcasting Company was founded not because David Sarnoff and others thought that radio was a great idea. They wanted to sell radio sets. And the more programming that was out there, the more likely people were to buy radio sets. And so that's how NBC was founded. As you get to the state of Iowa, you find an entirely different situation. And as our great friend Jack Shelley once said, the radio station could provide a service, particularly in rural areas, that the people had never known before. Many radio stations in Iowa were actually started by rural electric companies in the 1920s. Why? Not because they thought radio necessarily was a great idea, but radio might be an appliance in your home that would give you one more reason to get hooked up with rural electricity. <laughs> this is the sort of thing that I certainly didn't experience. Uh, I am closing in on 50. As I try to explain it to the college students I teach, who are less than half my age, if I can draw them away from the devices that they're staring at and using their thumbs to operate, it's hard to imagine where we were not as connected as we are. And again, that's why I think that Iowa broadcasting is so important. 
because of the fact that the presence of radio and then television could connect us in the far off regions of the state, the most rural areas, in a way that could not have ever been done before. And the parallels historically between how radio evolved in the 1920s and how the internet evolved during the first part of this century, the parallels are striking. Because again, the great equalizer now is the internet. And, not coincidentally, the fact that thousands of radio stations are now available on the internet. For example, I can sit in my office, during a break, of course, never during work time, but I can sit in my office in Oskaloosa, Iowa, and listen to virtually any radio station I want. I can listen to KASI on my computer. I can't get it in the car. I can't get it at home on a radio. I can get it through the computer. So again, bridging the gap in ways that had never been contemplated before. Radio was the first form of mass communication. It's true that 500 years before, Gutenberg invented a movable type printing press, but we did not have true mass communication until we could connect with people across distances simultaneously with the same message. When the register shows up at your doorstep every morning, that's mass communication, but you're not all reading the same article at the same time. You don't have that same commonality of experience that broadcasting can bring to us. One of the rules that is in place is that every station must identify itself at least once an hour. And there may be a lot of similar frequencies. For example, there's a 1430 on the AM dial here in Ames. There's a 640. But there are 640s around the country. There are 1430s around the country. But there's only one WOI. There's only one KASI. And so those call letters, that's the fingerprint. And so once an hour, the FCC says, you have to say who you are. And sometimes it's done in imaginative ways. WHO, the voice for victory, Des Moines. WHO, the voice for victory, Des Moines. When do you suppose that was the identification of the Jews? World War II. And what I find striking about that is they would have used that. No one would have thought anything of it. No one would have complained. Just think back over the past, just say, 10 years. If a station would have used an idea like that or during the Vietnam conflict, would there have been a reaction? Sure. Sometimes these IDs are rather formal. WMT. 600 are your job. Well, that got your attention. <laughs> and that's the whole idea, is to get your attention. That's from WMT in Cedar Rapids around 1960. And here's one that I learned to love and then hate because we had to play it once an hour, every hour. <laughs> honor to say where you were from. And now, a lot of stations, especially music-intensive FM stations, they kind of bury the identification in between commercials. Um, it's not the same art. Um, and I could go on for hours about jingles from old-time radio, but that's perhaps another time. In Northeast Iowa, one of the pioneers of broadcasting was R.J. McElroy. <coughs> McElroy started doing man-on-the-street programs for WMT radio. And then after the war, once he was mustered out of the service, he started his own station in Waterloo, later moved to television as well. And this is from the inaugural broadcast. They played the national anthem. They had uh, a few local dignitaries make speeches about how important it was to have a radio station there in Waterloo. A member of the clergy said a prayer. But among the things that were said that day was this by McElroy. And this is what I really think makes broadcasting unique. It's that connection between the broadcaster and the audience. Uh, Jack Shelley used to say, and I found it to be true as well, you can write whatever you want for the newspaper. The byline is there, but people don't recognize you on the street from a byline. 
people recognize your voice. They may not be able to connect from where, but I literally had that happen to me where I'm in line at a high beam coral bill of all places, and I'm talking to a friend, and there's somebody behind in line. And I always find it annoying when they kind of push you with the cart like you're not moving fast enough. But she kept kind of leaning forward like she was listening. And I was writing a check back in the days, I guess, when we still wrote checks at the grocery store. Can you tell I'm having a little problem with this turning 50, getting older? <laughs> anyway, I'm writing the check. And I thought she was going to go over the cart to try to see what the name was on the check. And I thought it was odd. And I said something at work that day about it. My boss said, that's tremendous. And I did not see how somebody stalking me was tremendous, but he did. He said, no, it means they recognized your voice. She knows she's heard you from somewhere. She must be a listener to the station. Well, that's true. And certainly television changes everything as well. People and, in my mind, local content, a connection with the local community, that's what makes broadcasting special. And that's what makes it unique. Back in the 1920s, we started Man on the Street broadcasts. And the second one ever done in America was done in Ottumwa in 1928 by this gentleman here, lower right hand corner. His name is Art Shepard. He later went on and did this for many years with WMT Radio in Cedar Rapids. That's also Shepard at the very top. The top photo is in front of the Woolworth store in Cedar Rapids. Lower left is McElroy along with a fellow named Howdy Roberts in Waterloo. And lower right is Shepard again. They would take the microphone out and just interview people. In Marshalltown, it was at the Kresge store at Center and Main. Stations did this all over the country, ultimately. Just what are you thinking today? What are you feeling? Uh, just trying to get people involved. And look at the crowds that would gather to watch people talk into a stick. <laughs> but it was all very new. And you fast forward then, maybe 30, 40 years, and in fact, you still see it. If someone's driving down the street and you happen to see a TV station vehicle there, and maybe a camera, you almost cause an accident. Why? Well, what are they doing? There must be something at channel whatever is here. We're fascinated by watching these things. And the expressions on the faces of the people, uh, they're just delighted by this. Art Shepard told a story once, and you have to understand that in the early days, a microphone was the size of a dinner plate, and it would be on a stand, on a table. Well, in order to do their outdoor man on the street broadcast in Tumwa, they literally threw a cable out the window down to the sidewalk. And then they'd plug in this microphone that he would literally hold like this in front of him. And so if he wanted to talk to you, he would just kind of shove this apparatus in your face. And it was very clear. It was radio. Well, Art had some health issues. And so it was a hassle for him to carry this. And so he said to the engineers, is there any way you can make this smaller? Maybe something I can just wear. Much like the microphone that I have under my lapel, which you can't even tell. And so they figured out a way to make a miniature little microphone that he hung around his neck. And that was fine. The problem was he went down the street, he walked up to a fellow to put him on the radio, and said, well, sir, what are you doing? And the fellow looked at him and said, none of your GD business, and kept walking. <laughs> he did not censor his comments, as I just did, on his behalf. Imagine how that would be if you heard it today. Imagine how it was 80 years ago, and you'll not be surprised to know that was the first, last, and only time Art Shepard used the little microphone for Man on the Street. <laughs> well, the television got into the act. This is the State Fair with a very spiffy KRNT TV <coughs> news cruiser, a very formal platform on the back. And a whole line of people waiting to be interviewed for a program called What Do You Say, which is hosted by Russ Van Dyke. And that is Russ with the hat interviewing people at the State Fair. Again, the integration of the audience is one of the hallmarks of what makes this all so unique.
I could tell you wonderful stories about how well broadcasting has been used by the people who have the microphones, but that would be boring. So let me tell you about someone who's a bit of a charlatan, Norman Baker. Norman Baker operated a station, KTNT, in Muscatine. He said it stood for No, the Naked Truth. Now, as a parenthetical, nowadays you can ask the FCC for call letters to match whatever image you want for your station. Back then, most of the time, they were just randomly assigned. And you then sort of made up what it meant. So Baker made up No, the Naked Truth. Well, the short of it with Norman Baker is he said that doctors knew nothing and that his potions and injections and theories could help heal you because all the doctors are in it together just to get your money. And so he would sell these things via mail order through the radio. He set up a little hospital in Muscatine where he would inject people with this clear liquid that he said would cause you to uh, recover from cancer, etc. It was all a complete and utter sham. Uh, but what he put together there was sort of one-stop shopping. He got the idea from Shenandoah, where Earl May, from whom you've already heard, and Henry Field had competing radio stations designed to get the word out about their seed and nursery businesses. And they would literally have live programs in auditoriums very much like this, and people would drive thousands of miles at times to come to see the great Shenandoah radio stations. And if you're going to bring people in, well, then you better have a hotel and a cafe and a gas station and a store. And that's what they set up there. So Norman Baker did the same thing. The Baker Institute, which would, of course, help you with whatever ills you had. He had the Naked Truth magazine, an advertising agency, because obviously he was good at promotion. Uh, there was the cafe, the radio station, the service station, etc. Ultimately, the American Medical Association filed some complaints against him, with good reason, because literally he was killing people. Um, he left the state of Iowa. He hid out. Later, he went south of the border and started projecting a signal back into the United States. But while he was on the run, Norman Baker decided you know what? I'm going to run for governor of Iowa. And I will do it without living in Iowa because I will be arrested if I come to Iowa. <laughs> I suppose his idea was if he won, he could then pardon himself. I'm not sure. <laughs> Honest looking guy, right? Um, he's going to clean up the state. Well, that's wonderful. Norman did not win, by the way. He ultimately was arrested. He ultimately served time in federal prison. But he never had to give back any of the money because he had been very good about secreting it away. Came up with something like half a million dollars in the 1930s. I believe the correlation is four and a half million dollars today. And in prison he admitted that he fooled the people and he lived a very nice life in retirement in Florida. This is the first example, though, of someone who said, you know what, I have popularity based upon being on the radio. And I might be able to parlay that into a political career. Now, I can't imagine anybody actually thinking that that could work. <laughs> well, there's that. He wasn't the first one, though. WHO Radio's first news director was a fellow named H.R. Gross. H.R. Gross hired a young guy named Jack Shelley to be his assistant, by the way. In 1940, H.R. Gross decided, I'm going to run for governor of Iowa as a Republican. Never mind that there's an incumbent Republican, I'm going to beat him in the primary. And since I'm H.R. Gross, I don't need to campaign. And he was almost right. Gross lost the primary. But in every county where WHO had a strong signal, he won. It was only the outlying counties that didn't know of him. So he left WHO, went to Cincinnati for a time, came back to Iowa, 
started to work for a 50,000 watt radio station in Waterloo known as KXEL and used that to victory in a congressional election in, I believe it was 1948, served 24 years representing Northeast Iowa in Congress before a young guy named Grassley took over. Broadcasters like to look to Edward R. Murrow as the patron saint. Um, and anytime you hold anyone up on a pedestal, look out because sometimes the foundation is crumbling. But Murrow truly knew how to use the medium of radio and then later television. But he also was very shy, nervous, um, did not have a great sense of confidence about what he was doing. This quote, however, is something that I like to remind broadcasters of because when you're on television, when you're on the radio, uh, you can start believing the nice things that those people say about you when they come up to you in the paint store and the grocery store. And sometimes you just need to remember that you're not any smarter than anybody else. Well, broadcasting really took off, especially in the first part of the 20th century, because you could make a receiver at home. Voice Life magazine would have the schematics in it every so often. And here's your Iowa connection again. What better cylinder was there than a Quaker Oats box <laughs> to hook all of it up, up so that you could hear things? And because I'm big on Iowa connections, let me introduce you to this fellow. This is Lee DeForest. He was born in Council Bluffs. He invented a thing called the Audion Tube, which is that device there. And anyone who knows anything about engineering can explain it far better than me. But what he invented was a way so that the signal could be amplified quickly enough so that you did not have to sit with an earphone crammed in your ear to hear things. The Audion brought the signal in and amplified it so you could actually have it in a speaker. Now granted, DeForest's invention of the Audion was made possible by other discoveries before him. And by the way, lawsuits aplenty about this. But if it were not for this discovery, that meant you could sit a radio set down and not have to be crouched over it to hear, right, that changes everything. It now becomes the centerpiece for the focal piece of our living room. The first non-commercial radio station west of the Mississippi that was formally licensed was what started as WHAA, later WSUI at the University of Iowa, and I had the privilege of working there while I was a student. And as they changed the name and officially dedicated the station in 1924, leave it to a college professor to spoil all the fun, I can say that I am a college professor, what he is saying is it's really great that we can send our thoughts out to the world. But shouldn't we first have things worthy of being said in mind? Talk about a corollary between radio in the 1920s and the internet of today. <laughs> <laughs> the number of times we go to the computer and start clicking around and then realize, I have nothing left to look for. There's nothing here. You know, and again, the number of web pages that people put up and then never update. I mean, it's the same thing. It matters not what the communication device is, you have to have something to say in order for anyone to care. Let me treat you to another bit of Iowa history. This is Herbert Hoover, 31st president of the United States, and to this point, the only individual to become president who was born in the state of Iowa. That's not why he's up here. He's up here because Herbert Hoover was Secretary of Commerce in the Harding and Coolidge administrations, and it was at that time that broadcasting started to be regulated by the federal government. Hoover was the first broadcast regulator prior to the Federal Communications Commission even being set up in 1927. It is still in the Commerce Department today. What was happening was that the limited number of frequencies out there were being flooded by people who were starting up stations all over the place, in their homes, uh, in their garages. 
And the problem when you have two people talking at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, is you can't hear either. And so the government got involved and said, we need to regulate it just like we do other natural resources like rivers. Rivers belong to all of us, so you can't pollute. Similarly, the airwaves belong to all of us. And in order to maximize that resource, the government gets to say who has licenses, at what power, at what frequency, etc. And Herbert Hoover was the first broadcast regulator in America. He did not like being on the radio. He was uncomfortable by it. He did not think he sounded good. And by comparison, his successor, Franklin D. Roosevelt, really took to the new media. And I'm not saying that Hoover being a little more aggressive in broadcasting would have helped in 1932, but we obviously know the lore of what Roosevelt did with radio after he became president. This next picture comes from Shenandoah, and you saw it briefly in the opening montage, but it's just too good to have pass by. Because some of you are no doubt saying, is that really a rooster on the table? Yeah, it is. Florence Falk, she did a show on KMA in Shenandoah for many years, then other Shenandoah stations. She went by the moniker The Farmer's Wife, and she did the show from their farm. And occasionally, there would be guests on the show, and that's one of them. <laughs> she would uh, even go on the air, and as she was doing her program, say, oh, by the way, if any of you listening see the farmer in town, would you tell him to pick up such and such at the store because I forgot to tell him before he left? And invariably, three people would say, your wife just said. <laughs> and don't we all need that kind of a whole watch dog? By the time of World War II, radio played a huge role in the lives of Americans. And one of the most unique circumstances came from WHO. One of the only local radio stations in America to send people to cover the war. The first Iowa war correspondent was WHO's farm director, Herb Kleinbeck, who got a visa to go overseas as part of a BBC uh, exchange program. What they wanted at the time was not war correspondents, but they wanted people, like farm broadcasters, to talk about the plight of the British people so that Americans would uh, feel a little better kinship. At that time, though, once he got over there, Planbeck found it was really easy to get accredited as a war correspondent. And so he traveled all around, and he was there at the time of the German surrender. And this is a broadcast uh, made around the time of the E Day. This is your war correspondent, Herb Kleinbeck, speaking from Germany on the evening of the glad day when the end of the war in Europe was announced to all men here. This is another of those occasions when mere words cannot tell the whole story. The story we've waited so long to bring you and the one you've waited so long to hear. Unquestionably, you've known the joyous tidings for some hours. Undoubtedly, a great many of you have already uttered prayers of gratitude, just as many of your boys and the rest of us have in this part of the war-weary world. Perhaps there's already been some celebrating started in Old Line, Somerset, Inwood, Centerville, Fort Madison, Indianola, West Side, Eldridge, Mitchellville, and every other town and city and community in Iowa, as well as in every other state. Here in Germany, as well as in Austria, where our 7th Army troops fought until Saturday, and where I was earlier today, at the time the news first reached us, and in every other part of Europe, the E-Day will not be officially observed until Tuesday. But nevertheless, today is a day of prayerful gratitude. You might say, well, that's that was radio. For 1945, it's even better when you know that it was sent from a U.S. military transmitting station via shortwave to London, then across the Atlantic to New York, then through a landline to Des Moines, where it was recorded onto a wax platter, a record, and that's how we got that. Amazing what broadcasters had to go through. 
certainly by no means anything compared to those fighting. But to get the story back, there were so many things that they had to do. Jack Shelley is the only local <coughs> war correspondent to have covered both the Pacific and European theaters, a feat that he was justifiably quite proud of. This is a broadcast just after the first atomic bomb was dropped, and it was the greatest story that he almost never told. Let's listen to a bit of it, then I'll tell you why. This is Jack Shelley on Guam. The one recording you're about to hear was made at a B-29 base somewhere in the Marianas, where I attended one of the most disturbing press conferences of the Pacific War. In a large conference room, crew members of the plane which dropped the atomic bomb in the first two missions over Japan, and the pilots that took part in development and research, making those weapons possible, told their stories. Immediately after the conference, I was able to record the voices of a number of those men. Now, one of the things that was uh, interesting about that is that it was a news conference. And for most of the time during the war, none of WHO's correspondents had recorders. Tape had not been invented. That was one of the spoils of war that we got from the Germans. And so in order to do a recording, you did it on a wire recorder. Instead of a strand of tape going across the recording heads, it was a tightly braided wire. And the problem was that it had to be tight, had to be taut in order for it to play, but if it was too tight, it would break. And it would then just become an amazing snarl. It's sort of like if you took a piece of yarn and pulled it really tight and then it snaps, you'll notice that it starts unraveling. Same thing. Shelley had a wire recorder at this point in the war. He did these interviews. He went back to the naval transmission station. The engineer was going to load it up. Shelley's getting ready and he's told everybody in San Francisco at NBC and Des Moines, get ready, I've got a scoop. There was not another radio reporter at that news conference. This was the only time people would hear the voices of the men who piloted the Enola Gay, the pilot of which lived in Des Moines for many years as a boy. So Jack's ready to go. The engineer comes in and says, I'm sorry, Jack, the wire broke. We lost it. Jack, uh, for those, of course, who knew him, uh, had remarkable restraint. He was a very patient man. It had to be sorely tested on this occasion. But he said to the, the young uh, radio engineer, just cut off whatever is bad, loop it through, let's try to save something, let's see what we have. And to his delight, he turned on the wire recorder when he was doing the interviews and he started talking about the scene and the number of people in the room and who he was gonna to talk to. And then he asked a question, put the microphone in front of Colonel Tibbetts' face. That's where the tape or the wire would work. It was all snarled as Jack did all of this wonderful talk up. And as he pointed out, I was such a blabbermouth, I actually wound up being fine because I missed nothing important, got a clean start, and it was a historic interview. Now you might remember the WHO owl, the wise old owl, uh, the randomly assigned call letters of WHO, which of course spelled who, and the folks at the Banker's Life Company, which started the station, thought, hey, who, an owl makes a sound like uh, let's make the owl our logo. And that carried on to the early days of television as well. I remember growing up seeing this at the top of every hour. So that was pretty high level animation for the 1960s. The owl sort of flew a little bit. I really love the station logos and and branding that are done uh, over time. You might remember a few of these that come from what was originally KRNT TV. KRNT, as in Register and Tribune, started by the radio station KRNT, which had been started by the newspaper. And you'll notice in the upper right, one of the original logos, and as things changed, ownership changed, the call letters changed, the logos have changed, etc. Closer to where we are tonight came Channel 4. And I said that right, because WOI went on the air as Channel 4. 
It was the second station licensed in Iowa back in 1950 and later moved to Channel 5. Similarly, in the Quad Cities, what was Channel 6 started as Channel 5. There was not very much television as the 1950s began, and here's why. There was a lot of interest in television, and then World War II came along, and all development of television stopped. After the war, the FCC was flooded, Federal Communications Commission was flooded with applications. They could not decide who should get a license. There were only a certain number of stations. So they started approving licenses and then said, just stop. We're putting in place a freeze. We will not act on any licenses for a few months. This is 1948, for a few months until we figure out what we're going to do. In typical government fashion, the freeze was lifted in 1952, four years later. If you had your license, you could go put a station on the air. That's how WOC-TV in Davenport went on the air in 1949 on Halloween night. That's how WOI went on the air in Ames in 1950. But for many years, there was nothing. And then the freeze was lifted, licenses started to be released, and that's how you wound up with WHO going on the air in Des Moines in 1954, KRNT, now KCCI in 1955. One of the more unique examples in America actually happened in Cedar Rapids and Waterloo. They had no television stations on the air. And then in a six week period in the fall of 1953, 60 years ago, not one, not two, but three stations all went on the air. So as of September 29th, they had no local stations. They were trying to get signals from Ames, Davenport, Chicago, and the Twin Cities. Between September 29th and Thanksgiving, they had Channel 2, Channel 9, and Channel 7 all on the air in that very limited period of time. So speaking of television, let's see if uh, these clips strike a responsive chord with anyone. We're going to take time out and go to a warmer place by far, the riverbank. Ta-da! Turn on the motor and the light. It appears that San Francisco 49er running back O.J. Simpson is through for the remainder of the National Football League season. Simpson suffered a shoulder separation last weekend, but he declined surgery with hopes of playing again this year. Team doctors say Simpson could recover in three weeks, but said that is definitely a long shot. We had 90 degree high down at uh, Kansas City. We had 87 up at Madison, Wisconsin. On the other side of the contrasting air mass situation, we had a 48 up at Bismarck, North Dakota. This is Dole trying to go over the top of Fife. Fife kept it alive on the rebound and picked up by Pratt. Gives it to Davidson to pass up court, thrown away. Ooh, you saw Pratt right over the scorer's table. <laughs> United Flight 232 en route from Denver to Chicago. Attempting an emergency landing at the Sioux City Airport. Crashed just before 4 o'clock this afternoon. The scene of the crash as New Center 4 photographers at the scene captured the video when the DC-10 making an emergency landing, crashed on approach to runway 22, turned over and burned. Television has done a lot of things for us, some of it good, um, some of it not as good. Uh, I grew up in Tama County, and that meant I was in between the Des Moines and Cedar Rapids markets. So at a time before cable, when you have all these channels, I had six or seven TV channels when most people only had three. And so it's no wonder that I turned out the way I did. I'm not sure that's good, but you know, we always hear about Sesame Street, right? Educational television. Well, we had our own form of educational television right here because somebody like me could learn his numbers by watching Channel 8 News because look at the shape of the desk. <laughs> See, nowadays there's always a little thing in the corner to tell you what channel you're watching. There was no mistake. And as I said, I grew up being able to watch two TV markets, and so the folks in Waterloo helped me out <laughs> of the scale. In the clip a moment ago, you saw uh, one of the legendary TV weathermen, Conrad Johnson. Started in Sioux City, went on to Cedar Rapids. Uh, and you saw how weather has changed. They used to use little markers on a wall-sized map. Well, one of the more unique ways to do weather in America was done in Des Moines at Channel 8. There's Russ Van Dyke with the glass weather map that rightly so is in the State Historical Museum in Des Moines.
Thomas was not left-handed. I'm now going to spoil the surprise. So if you want to look away for a moment, here's how it really looked. In the upper left, that's what you saw on television. The lower right is how they did it by turning the polarity of the camera around. So Russ is writing, and it's backwards as you look at it, but when they flip the image in the camera, it looks good to you. And that was a trick that not a lot of people figured out. They did sometimes wonder how come his pocket square was on this side of the suit when <laughs> pockets are over here. But that's the magic of the glass looking at. That fellow definitely has a face for radio. <laughs> you may remember Hey Bob. Maybe you remember that guy. Bill Riley. Bill Riley had a kid's show on radio. And they used to pack the Shrine Auditorium in Des Moines on Saturday mornings for the Hey Bob show. You never saw Hey Bob on the air because it was radio. But they would bring out this dummy, this ugly looking dummy. Bob stood for be on the beam. And so Bill Riley would try to teach kids to do the right things. Don't be a hey Bob. And the kids would love it. And that led to Bill Riley doing all sorts of kids shows on television, in addition to many other things. I'm not sure you can tell there, but he's holding a, a loaf of Wonder Bread doing a commercial for the bread with the red, yellow, and blue balloons on the front. Now, the fact that I can remember that slogan years later, and you'll notice his attire fits, explains why the federal government put a rule in place by the late 1970s. Because if Bill Riley was wearing that coat holding Wonder Bread and telling you to go tell Mom to buy some, Mom bought it or else had to listen to the kid, right? There was such power by the kid show hosts that did commercials that the FCC said kid show hosts can't do commercials. It's an unfair advantage. And that's why there are these, if you're watching a children's show, a cartoon, whatever, they make a big deal to say, we'll be back after these commercial messages. And then there's the commercials, and then they'll say, we'll now return to the program. To try to make it as clear as possible what is the show and what is not? Now, in my view, if you make a big deal about attention, here comes the commercials. That's putting more focus on it, but they're the FCC, and I'm lucky to just be here talking to you. <laughs> Speaking of kid shows, 43 years, the longest running children's program in America, originating in Ames, Iowa, for all 43 years. There was another long-running program that came out of Des Moines that I wound up having some affiliation with. Uh, for 30 years, Dwayne Ellett and Floppy were on Channel 13, and they became better known to a lot of people because they also did things at the State Fair, and Dwayne traveled around the state with Floppy. And that's one reason why, even though it was only on 30 years, and it ended in 1987, uh, the connection with a lot of people is deeper. Floppy and Dwayne, probably be Dwayne and Floppy because Floppy couldn't drive, I guess, would go to these <laughs> community festivals, do programs, etc. And a couple of years ago, we did um, a Floppy Film Festival at the State Historical Society, and over four different performances, a thousand people came in to watch some clips of the programs, and that led us to do a series of DVDs, which uh, I'm pleased to uh, have out. Uh, if you're interested, the proceeds of all of the things out there go to various causes. For example, the war documentary, the proceeds, the portion of the proceeds go to veterans' causes, and any that I sell in Ames always go to your Honor Flight group here, which did such a great job last year, hopefully can do more. Uh, the floppy material has gone to the Historical Society and also to animal rescue operations. That's how floppy started. <laughs> There was a lost dog segment on the TV station, and they thought it would be better if a dog was reading it. And because real dogs who could talk were hard to find and rather expensive, <laughs> Dwayne Allen came up with, with Floppy. Well, over the course of time, sometimes things just don't work. Um, 
It's really amazing they work as well as they do, given all of the things that are involved. It used to be hard for us to explain to people when things didn't work because, well, you didn't understand. Now all we have to do is to say, oh, the computer messed up. And you all understand perfectly. <laughs> but a station would have to, in the old days, have a test pattern and would have to have graphics to say, we're off air for a second or we're coming back. The one I just showed you was from Channel 8. This is one from Channel 13. There's another one from Channel 13. The lower right shows you how everybody at the station felt like, okay, we've got this taken care of, we're coming back on the air. The upper left is, again, the best way to explain most of these. You see these little creatures that are apparently ripping up film or something, and the sign says, silence, gremlins at work. And anyone who's ever worked in the field I think can testify that that's the best explanation for most things that go wrong. Now, how do you those darn gremlins? Because it certainly can't be any button that I just pushed. Well, with that, um, I am very happy to take your questions. Again, I'm so happy to be able to share the topic with you tonight. Um, I've been privileged to work on a number of books and uh, DVDs, as Kathy mentioned. I'm happy to uh, share those with you afterwards if you'd like. But if you have any questions, happy to take them out. where they look at the clock and they realize if they ask a question, they're just going to have to stay long. <laughs> there is a question in the back. We have the microphone. All right. Actually, the students are already reaching for their car keys by now, so you're far more polite, and I appreciate it. Would you care to comment on the sale of WOI? <laughs> Would I care to comment on the sale of WOI as somebody who was working in Hamilton Hall at the time it went down? Um, the people who did it were probably very well intentioned, but I cannot think of a bigger mistake that could have been made in terms of hampering journalism and education and uh, losing what was an irreplaceable and unique asset. So I guess I have a thought on it. I didn't realize I still felt that strongly 20 years later. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, my, my name is Denny Goodrich. I, I worked at uh, Channel 5 for 14 years from 73 to 86. Uh, and I've continued to work at Iowa State since then. And one of the, this is just a comment about Herb Klanbeck. He continued to do that on in the dead Ombar. And uh, through archives, a piece of tape came past me where he was interviewing I'm going to be choked up. Uh, he was interviewing Iowa soldiers in Vietnam. Oh, yes, yeah. And then one of the men, he, I remember, it was a, a guy, a brother, one of my high school classmates. So I copied that tape and sent it on to them. But I didn't know if they ever had heard it. And I believe they hadn't. And then the good side of that is that he was able to tell them stories he'd never told before. Oh, that is a tremendous story. I'm so glad you shared that. It reminds me of one from Ames. Um, a very similar situation. It actually involved Mr. Planbeck. Uh, there was a gentleman uh, named Gerald Pepper from Ames. Uh, passed away a few years ago, I believe. And um, I had uh, the whole, all of the WHO material I had uh, at that time to process, try to digitize, do things with it. And uh, Rick Fredrickson uh, with Iowa Public Radio borrowed some of the material to do some features. And one of them was Herb Planbeck in interviewing soldiers. And there was a historic broadcast on the Sunday after VE Day, which was Mother's Day, where members of the Army just piled into trucks and met Herb at one place, and he just went down the line and got Mother's Day greetings from all of these people. It was a special 30-minute program. So Rick airs something, and Mr. Pepper emails him and says, I was part of that broadcast. I'd asked Mr. Planbeck over time if he had a copy, and uh, Herb had had a fire at his house, and he didn't think anything existed. Do you suppose it still exists? And we went through the records, because they were literally on wax platters that were at that time 70 years old. And after whatever hours of searching, we found the segment 
where he was hurt. And it was all 16 seconds. Um, but uh, we put it together on a disc. And Rick and I went to the Pepper home and played it for him. And it was just an amazing reaction because he started telling a story about what he did when he heard that there was um, to be peace. And I could tell it was a story his wife and daughter probably never heard uh, in that same way, just kind of unlock things. And so uh, it was, in a very small way, the, my Brokaw Bridge generation moment was to, and he, of course, had never heard it. And that's what I really think is so great about some of these things, is that we have the ability to you know, let generations uh, hear the things. I've been hoping to work with some veterans groups um, in two wonderful facilities, one at Camp Dodge, the Gold Star Museum, and one the Sullivan Museum in Waterloo, that have records of veterans. And I would love to be able to take some of these broadcasts that Jack and Herb did, transcribe the names, and try to connect with the family. Um, it's a huge task, but it would be great for them to, to be able to. But thank you for that. Dennis, one of the to start to say, I've often heard that the origin of WHO was with hands only because of Palmer uh, chiropractic. Is there any veracity to that? Colonel B.J. Palmer, who was really no colonel, but Colonel B.J. Palmer um, wrote a book called Radio Salesmanship. And it was a very thick book. And as I tell this story, you'll see why he wrote a book called Radio Salesmanship. Um, there is no truth that it stands for that except after the fact. And here's what I mean. Most call letters were sequentially given in the early days. And so the station in line before the folks in Des Moines got WHN. They got WHO. The next person got WHP. So it was totally coincidental. In addition, the Banker's Life Company started WHO and sold it to Palmer. So Palmer was associated with WOC in Davenport, which the lore is, stands for Wonders of Chiropractic. Okay? BJ didn't put that station on the air either. A fellow named Robert Carloa started it in Rock Island, ran out of money immediately, sold it to BJ Palmer, who moved it across the river. It became an Iowa based station. So Palmer came up with, okay, I got WOC, what can that stand for? That's where he came up with Wonders of Chiropractic. He then bought WHO with hands only. <laughs> so, so the direct answer, Dennis, is yes, that's what it stands for, but only through the back door. Similarly, WOI. We've all heard the story that somebody kind of looked up and saw uh, from the backside um, I, the words Iowa State College painted on the window of the door, and from the back, you can see WOI. Oh, that would be great. It's a wonderful story. I only wish it would be. Please. Um, could you comment on the importance of women in broadcasting and how Iowa seems to be very much pioneer in bringing women in broadcasting? <coughs> you pointed out the House of Magic Window, but I think Mary Jane O'Dell and some of the various other women in uh, broadcasting in Iowa. There were a number of women who took to the airwaves in Iowa before they did in other parts of the country, and it was really because, I think, uh, the people who were running stations in Iowa knew that the role of a woman was much different in Iowa lifestyle. That's a clumsy way of saying that in the old days, farm wives did an awful lot of work and were an important part of the whole thing. And so I think there was the recognition of, well, why not put a woman on the air? Uh, but there's a lot of pushback from that at times. Uh, I've seen correspondence where Herb Planbeck hired a female to do ag news in the 1950s on the radio. And that did not sit well with a lot of people. And there was one person who wrote in, and the gist of the note is, I don't need a woman telling me farm news. And Mr. Planbeck was a wonderful writer. And he used some tremendous words in the response that he wrote <laughs> to this party. Suffice to say, in no uncertain terms did he make clear that that woman was 
had a seat behind a WHO microphone as long as she wanted it, no matter what that fellow said. Uh -huh. Any, Any other, other questions? Well, thank you folks so much. I welcome the chance to visit with you in the lobby afterwards. Uh, I hope this has been uh, worth your time tonight. And uh, you've been very appreciative, and I appreciate that. So thank you. This program is another standard service of the more than 21,000 standard oil dealers and agents in mid-America who give meaning to the pledge, you expect more from standard and you get it. <laughs>